Добрый день, добро пожаловать на воркшопы в рамках фестиваля Акусмониум. Мы начинаем э, с директора центра GRM, Франсуа Бане, э, центра, на чьей системе, собственно, проходит наш фестиваль. Э, Франсуа э, сотрудник GRM 2007 года, с 2018 года директор, также помимо этого он, естественно, композитор, а также теоретик и писатель. Э, сегодня у нас будет три артиста, только три завтра. Здесь это у нас такая, так сказать, офф, дополнительная э, программа фестиваля, где... Участники, которые выступают на сцене в рамках Акузмониума, говорят и показывают стерео, восьмиканальные работы, исторические, что угодно, ответ на вопрос. Все то, что не, не, месилось, не мешается в рамки Акузмониума на концерте, но тем не менее интересно. Поэтому а, регламент такой, что сначала на каждого участника у нас один час, а из них минут 40-50 артистов, ну и, соответственно, дальше вопрос, ответ, перерыв перед следующим артистом. Спасибо вам. Thank you for being here this afternoon and joining us in this dark room, although it's uh, fully summer outside. In the description of the of the presentation, it was written that I uh, will uh, use a quick exploration of music concrete uh, genesis and its fundamental concept to try to expose the contemporary stakes of experimental music. Well, we have one hour, so it was a bit ambitious, but uh, I'll try to go uh, that way anyway, with uh, maybe a more a bigger focus on the question of um, musical and sound objects, and the question of sound itself, uh, going back to some fundamental concept, to uh, new ideas and new um, strategies for uh, composition, hopefully. Uh, we'll try to be clear. I will try as well to manage a uh, little time to exchange at the end of the presentation so we can, if something's not clear, you can hold it in your mind and I can come back. As maybe all of you, you've been uh, attending the concert uh, yesterday and the day before, just in case you didn't. My name is François Bonnet. Uh, I'm head of INA GRM. GRM stands for Groupe de Recherche Musicale, a musical research group. Uh, it's an adventure that started in 1948. And uh, between 1948 and 1958, the group was called Studio DC and then Groupe de Recherche en Musique Concrète in 51, before uh, named uh, in 1958 GRM. Why INA? It's because in 1974, uh, French national radio and television is uh, fractured into several uh, institution. Uh, INA is one of them. Um, uh, the mission of INA is more with audiovisual archives, teaching and research. Therefore, GRM was reattached to INA and became INA GRM. So what is GRM? GRM is a pioneering French public center for electroacoustic music concrete, acousmatic music, um, operating from Maison de la Radio in Paris. And we still, what we still do is we commission music works for composer, we develop compositional tools, uh, we promote electroacoustic, experimental, music concrete, acousmatic music through radio, concerts, records and uh, theoretical publication. That's what we do right now. So, um, again, very quickly, because we, have, we don't have a lot of time, and, but still, uh, I think it's interesting to uh, go back to um, fundamentals, basics. What um, is music concrete and why concrete? Uh, for Pierre Schaeffer, uh, we invented this, uh, this concept. Classical and instrumental traditional music were abstract music. A composer to compose music draws from his imagination ideas, translated into parameters, the notes, which are usually designed uh, with the help of three dimensions, pitch, duration, and intensity. These parametric information are registered on a piece of paper, the score. And the score is read by a musician who knows how to play the notes with instruments slowly over centuries designed to produce defined notes. That's the way at least Western music has been thought and done, let's say for 10th century roughly. But in the beginning of the 20th century, something very important happened. Sound could be recorded and broadcasted. 
It took some time uh, before techniques improved and someone uh, realized this aspect could change a lot in the field of music. Pierre Schaeffer was working at Studio DC, uh, at the French uh, radio diffusion in Paris, and was um, doing experimentation for radio drama first. So he was um, experimenting to create sound effects for radio dramas, using um, percussion, exotic instruments, and um, and already at the time, uh, we're talking about the mid-40s, he was uh, feeling the possibility of a music made uh, only with noise, and he was trying to build in his mind um, a noise piano. But uh, it didn't succeed very well, and uh, it took some years so he could really achieve what he had in mind. And um, this uh, era, which is the era of uh, mechanical reproduction, knows two defining moments in uh, music concrete history. One is called the locked groove, the other is called the cut bell. So very briefly, what is the locked groove? Yes, like this. At the radio, it was a time when you could broadcast and pre-recorded -pre shows before it was live events, and then there, were a possibility, there was a possibility to uh, broadcast recorded uh, shows. How do they um, record this show? They were uh, recorded on several shellac vinyl, and each vinyl could, let's say, uh, last three, four minutes. So the operators were passing uh, the vinyls from one to another, pretty much like DJ do now, like with cross-fading. So the broadcast show was kind of continuous, but actually it was several vinyls that were playing one after each other. And at the end of the vinyl, like it is still today, you've got a locked groove, so the needle doesn't go. <laughs> and uh, sometimes it could happen that the locked groove was recorded. And one day, Pierre Schaeffer decided to listen to one of these locked grooves again, again, and again, and again. And suddenly, he realized something, that by looping a short sample of sound, you don't really listen to the meaning of the sound or its origin, but you listen to the sound for itself as a pure formal object, a sound object. And from this sound object, you can create an abstract and musical motif. The second event is born with a mistake. Uh, during a recording session, uh, 19th April of 1948, a bell was recorded, but it was recorded a bit late, meaning that the player played the bell, but the recorder did it a bit later. So basically, they recorded the bell without the attack of the bell, of the sound of the bell. And Schaeffer realized that this bell sound without the attack was sounding more like a oboe. So this experience showed to him that by manipulating a recorded sound, you can actually detach the newly produced sound from the original one by technical manipulation. So let's come back to the try to find a definition of musique concrète very quickly. And we could say that musique concrète is a music fixed on a media, composed with concrete sounds, wherever they come from, exploiting acousmatic listening. So we have different things. I'll try to go back to this definition very quickly again. Fixed on a media, as we say, originally it was on a vinyl, then very quickly it became magnetic tapes. Um, so the sound uh, could be um, memorized into uh, a tape. Now it's hard drive as audio files. And um, it meant a lot of different things, but one of the things, it, it was possible to listen back to what you do with the manipulating sounds in real time. And so uh, every choice of sound, every editing, every juxtaposition of sounds could be monitored instantly, which is very different from a score. When you write on the score, you imagine how it can be, then you give it to a musician, and then you realize the, the gap. And usually, rehearsal I met to find uh, to reduce the gap. 
So fix to the media with concrete sounds. Concrete for Schaeffer means uh, real, existing. Uh, sources uh, can be any sound, including uh, traditional music instruments. It can be other sounds. It's not like Daniel told uh, two days ago, it's not only noise. It was called like music of noises. But um, noises in this broad, broad meaning, which is basically every, every sound possible. Exploiting acousmatic listening. So, acousmatic is a Pythagorean term reintroduced in uh, 1955 by French poet Jérôme Peignot. And it refers to this uh, tale of uh, Pythagoras, who was teaching um, behind a veil uh, or curtain, uh, and only the oldest student could be with Pythagoras. Uh, the other student, the acousmaticoi, had to be uh, on the other side of the, of the, of the, of the curtain. So this is a, a, an analogy of uh, this idea of acousmatic, which is now uh, very much like uh, uh, listening to a sound without seeing its source, which is basically the situation that the radio, uh, when you can hear a voice, you can hear music, but you can't hear the, and you can't see uh, the people who are doing it. So there's always um, a mystery behind. And two big uh, opportunities uh, result from the acousmatic situation. The first one is that uh, you can focus on the sound itself because you can't see anyone performing it. And so, I don't know if you if you, you, you probably did this experience, but when you're in the darkness, your sense of uh, hearing is much more developed because it's kind of compensate the lack of information you don't, you don't have with your eyes. And another way, which is something that uh, is very much into the, in, in the core of what we do in the, in the concert hall with this acousmonium and with this multi-channel sound system is because there's nothing to see, look at, um, so the directional aspect of the music is less strong. Uh, music can come from everywhere, and uh, even if instrumental modern era music like Zanaki Stokas and explore this way of trying to put the audience inside, uh, surrounded by, by the music, it was always, always um, possibly distracted by the instrumentist. You look at this orchestra, Look at this one, and with acousmatic listening, once you saw the speakers, you saw them, and then you can really immerse yourself into the sound. So, uh, and as I said, it's pretty. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be very quick and very on, on a string of this idea of um, trying to, to to see how this concept of sound object that we're going to explore now can be transformed or adapt or extended now for um, a contemporary um, stakes. So there's two last big concepts of the uh, Schaefferian heritage uh, for, for today. <laughs> One is called reduced listening. So in Schaefferian theory, reduced listening uh, is the attitude which consists in listening to the sound for its own sake, as a sound object, by removing its real or supposed source and the meaning it may convey. In reduced listening, our listening intention targets the sound object itself and not the sonic events that has produced it. And uh, it targets the object itself and the formal values which is carried in itself and not the discursive ones it refers to. Basically, if I do that, you will see that I drop my phone and say, oh, this phone's dropped, it makes sense. But if you don't see this event, then you can, um, uh, then you don't know what it is, and then you can um, observe uh, the sound uh, in other way. You can, you can find, for example, a rhythmic pattern. And uh, because of that, uh, it allows you to change uh, its value in a way and make it available for uh, a formal uh, discourse, which is uh, music. In, in the tradition of music concrete. And that's uh, really the, the point of, and the complexity of uh, Schaeffer theory, uh, because the reduced listening is um, supposed to, to get rid of everything and listen to the sound for itself as an object. And um, it triggers a lot of questions. 
And another point that triggers a lot of questions is how a sound object become a musical object. Um, in a Schaeferian theory, a sound object becomes a, a musical object when you decide that it is balanced and suitable enough to serve a musical purpose. This question of suitability is very problematic because it it's kind of it opens an antagonist um, antagonist case. Uh, uh, with this idea of radius listening, because uh, radius listening uh, borrows the concept of radius from a phenomenology, and uh, I, won't, I won't go too deep in that, but the phenomenology reduction is something that is very uh, at the core of uh, the experience of a being. It's kind of, uh, I get rid of all my sets and uh, all my, my knowledge, and I'm just naked in front of the world, and uh, I realize I'm, I'm alive because I'm conscious of some, something, or some, uh, and this um, very stripping for everything to go back to the um, only uh, uh, certainty that I'm, I'm a being because I'm a uh, I have a conscious and the conscious is always conscious of something is very deep and very very radical. By using this term in the field of uh, listening and listening in a, in a musical uh, in a musical um, uh, framework, it's a bit more problematic because. One could think that radio listening is a pure a listening or pure form of sound as object. But if you say that the sound is a sound, but the sound as a sound object, you already you already um, uh, give him a form, and you already uh, target him with a purpose. So uh, that doesn't mean that it doesn't work. That doesn't mean that it's um, not relevant. But it means that it can be maybe. Um, uh, observed and, uh, and trying in this first fundamental concept, trying to extend them to see what can be uh, adjusted in a way. Uh, I don't know if, my, if I'm clear, but maybe I will be uh, a bit more clear later and let maybe a little bit less abstract. I'm sorry. And we, have a, we will have a, a musical break in a few seconds, so just to... But um, the main approach of the Schaeferian era which I discovered a lot and allow uh, a lot of and generation of generation of composer to uh, to use every sound possible and to be uh, at ease with that because there are there is a conceptual background that just back it up. Um, we should not for, we should not forget that these theories are from the 50s and 60s, which is a very structuralist approach and era. And Schaeffer was always. Um, uh, thinking uh, is music, music concrete, as a couple between objects and structure. And um, I think it was very uh, coherent and very relevant at the time. And it was also linked to the possibilities of the, um, of the technical uh, way of composing sound. Basically, I record a sound um, on a tape, I, I, cut, I cut my piece of tape, I mix with another one, so it was very like sound coupling sound with another assembling and um, and it makes sense in this idea of object and structure. But uh, all the music made with tape, all the music that uh, come from the music concrete tradition uh, uh, were not even at the time made like that. And I think um, since this first conceptual approach a lot have, has been done and that's what uh, is interesting right now. But first Maybe we can listen to a short excerpt on uh, one of, um, I think, very beautiful and not very well known uh, piece, uh, which is very about uh, just gathering sound material, adding them together in a very beautiful way. Uh, it's a piece by Philippe Carson called Chermac. We will just listen like a, a couple of minutes. And um, it's a piece made in 1961, which is kind of crazy when you can hear the, the quality of the sound. We'll start with um, the second part actually of the piece, which is maybe more dynamic. Uh, the, the, the material was, was uh, gathered in a factory of tobacco in, uh, in the Netherlands and um, 
it's a pretty short piece, but uh, yeah, it's very like this kind of sound gathered, put it to objects, and 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 um, and composed very much uh, in a very inspired way, I think. But the idea, because we have, we have got this arc, we, we did the the, the historical uh, overview very quickly. Uh, now uh, I built this uh, talk uh, more in order to, to address uh, people who are creators or people who are uh, willing to uh, to continue this adventure of composing with sound. And uh, I think that we can extend the possibility of this idea of sound object with uh, going back to the very much very notion of sound itself. And what's a sound? Uh, Daniel asked this question as well. Uh, uh, in this uh, introductory presentation. And there are several uh, approaches. Of course, when I ask this question to my students, I usually receive uh, different kind of answers. Like for many, a sound is a wave. For other, more precise, it's sound is a vibration. Other elaborate even further and say that it's a, it's a vibration that propagates as a wave through a medium. And for other, sound is what you can hear. Through this different answer, uh, you can see at least two very different approaches. Uh, the first approach will assimilate the uh, sound as an event and the second one will assimilate the sound as a phenomenon. Let's try to see uh, both uh, possibility and uh, try to gather, extract things from that in a creative purpose. So what is a sound as a phenomenon? Sound understood as a phenomenal object um, is an object fundamentally taken up in a relation with and constituted by an address. Um, what, what does it mean? Let's, um, there's this uh, well-known enigma, uh, which is, uh, does a tree falling in the forest make a sound if no one is there to hear it? What would be the phenomenological uh, answer to that? The phenomenological, phenomenological sorry, uh, reasoning would respond, I think, as follows. If every object is an object for, there, there could never be a sound that could not be perceived in the sense that it only becomes sound because a subject perceives it. Therefore, not only can the tree not make a sound for no one, and therefore does not do so, but what is more, uh, it's a, more like a such sort of experiment, the absence of the presence and the tree doesn't fall itself. The, the event of, of the falling of the tree uh, doesn't happen as it's per se because nobody's here to witness, witness it. It's a very um, philosophy that is very meant into the perception of the world and say the world is a world I perceive and my consciousness is consciousness of something. Opposite way, uh, what is a sound as an event? This, in this theory uh, of eventual sound, the sound is primarily localized, a localized vibratory event that is not propagated. For example, for this theory, when you uh, have a tuning fork, put it in a, in a, in a, in a glass uh, bell, and you draw up all the air to make a void, you ring the tuning fork, there's no sound, then you push some air, sound appears. For the eventual theory, there were sound already in the beginning, because the event, um, physical event, uh, was there. And the fact that no one is perceiving it is not uh, very much uh, in question. So in this theory, the, this question of the tree falling in the, in the forest has his answer. Of course, sound is produced because a vibratory event is produced. So what is right? What should we decide? Uh, I won't take a, a poll here, but um, I think both uh, theories made their point and both made their weakness. For example, the weakness of uh, uh, phenomenolo phenomenological approach is um, with hallucination. If you hallucinate sound, there is a sound, but there's nothing else outside of you that hears the sound. So it's a limit case where sound doesn't exist but in your head. Weakness of eventual theory is that the eventual theory doesn't um, take into account uh, the unfolding of the sound. 
uh, wet is the sound event when uh, when you are on the seashore and uh, the sea is rumbling. There's a multiplicity of sound events and it's dampened by the air, that echoes, the resonances, and your experience of the sound is totally different of this multiplicity of um, sound events. So I'd like to propose this kind of uh, sky zoological approach. Uh, and this postulate of such an approach is that um, the nature of sound uh, can't be uh, considered uh, as um, a unity, but instead as a non-synthesizable multiplicity. From this point of view, the sound is considered to be by nature a disparate, which is uh, a fundamentally separate. Basically, there's no location of sound and no uh, pure nature of sound. The sound is a meeting point of um, something that's happening somewhere outside of you with physical um, existence, but with someone or something to welcome it. It's, um, I think it's interesting because the sound is not something that is, it's something that happens. And the happening is the meeting point of uh, two things, uh, an event and someone to gather in. And I think it's very fertile. If we go back to what uh, interests us here, it's um, musical expression, because it helps to see different point of access as creators to the sound. Trying to be clear in my examples. With this uh, theory, we can identify three stages of uh, the lifespan of a sound. The production of the sound event, the transmission of the sound and its travel, and the reception of the sound. Let's see with examples now, because time is running and it's time to listen to some music. Let's see some examples of people who have um, make a clear choice on where they, they, they act. by an um, English uh, composer based in Den Haag called Justin Bennett. And the tit is called uh, Masklafte Netherlands, site 2. And um, here uh, the compositional gesture of Justin Bennett is very clear and very simple in a way, but very re relevant. It, if he records a sound, so it's just one recording. It's not composed, it's not edited, it's just recorded. And here, um, Justin Bennett uh, has, is in this way like a phonographer, uh, very much like a photographer. His uh, skills and his talent is to find the place, find the sound, to find a good uh, way of point of view, of point of listening, and a good way to render it. And um, not a lot of people can uh, could have done that actually. So it's really like a personal gesture, but very uh, focused on the sound appearing, which is very the first step, the first stage of the sound. His work is finding sound and recording them. 
is doing a lot of different things, but in this CD at, uh, at least. And, um, and that's the first step of, uh, of composing, but it can be the only step, being focused on the sound event. Um, or we can uh, go further and uh, work on the, the travel sound mix between being here and being in your, in your, in, in your listening, in your mind. from 1991 and this piece is very uh, interesting because um, uh, Christian was taking the suburb train every day and doing the same journey and he was starting to listen to it every day to know it almost by heart this station this oh we go in a tunnel and um, and to him this old sound, this old journey was one sound, one uh, sound with a remarkable form, as he says. And he decided to record it and to reveal it like a, like a photograph in different bath, with different process, uh, different different treatment, different uh, uh, manipulation, transformation, to create slowly this big form that is it's called like a big musical object compared to the structuralist approach of uh, Schaeffer, that it's still, again, relevant and used today. Uh, we have now this idea of uh, a whole musical object within his own uh, universe in, in, inside. And so the, all the ability, all the compositional uh, focus is now not, not so much in the sound event, or of course in the sound event, but in how you um, extract it from what it is and how you uh, uh, give in musical purposes. Another example, a bit out of the field of pure acoustic and music concrete, but still using the same tools, is this. Satis music, but it's not Eric Satis music. It's of course uh, Eric Satis notes and uh, score performed by an uh, American composer called Akira Rabelais. But the re composition here is not uh, the interpretation of the of the piano. The composer here, 
doesn't compose the notes. They are already existing. It composes the quality of the sound. It composes the distance. It composes the impression. And is actually uh, trying to reactivate in this uh, record uh, the impression of remoteness he experienced listening to this piano music as a child. Um, this composer is called Akira Rable, and the album uh, is called Dear Esoptrophobia. Esoptrophobia is the fear of seeing you, your face in the mirror. And I think it's very interesting here because it's very much about this uh, um, idea where do I uh, put my compositional uh, work? I don't compose a note, I don't he could have not produced them, actually he's playing, uh, he's playing himself the piano, but it's, it's almost a detail, but he composes the way these uh, sounds are unfolding and are traveling in, into the space and the, and, the, and the time. And his compositional work is very much about working about the reactivation of time. And, um, and I think this idea of the sound as a meeting point of uh, something that's happening and something that is someone that is here to receive it allows this possibility of saying, OK, but maybe, maybe this meeting, meeting, meeting point takes time and takes um, a long distance and a long process. So we saw the sound as an event and the technique of uh, composition that really linked to the event, sound as a something that unfolds and travels through the space with uh, Christian and Akira. And at last I'd like to, and it would be like my two last examples because time is running, it would be to um, focus as a sound as an audible, which is a perceived phenomenon. And on this aspect, I think there's at least two ways of uh, dealing uh, with this aspect. You can either, either use uh, hard work to spell, the psychophysiology of the hear and try to play with that as a composer. Or you can uh, explore the sound as a placeholder of cultural and cognitive dimension, with, which is a bit heretic in, in the, in the the doxa of uh, music concrete, but let's not forget that music concrete was strongly structured with concept, but was never so much a dogmatic music. And uh, if you think about Luc Ferrari very early, this idea of hardcore music concrete when you can't recognize sound uh, was a bit uh, tempered. And, um, and even for Pierre Schaeffer himself, I think it's um, um, the idea of Schaeffer, again, is, was to, 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 to create an apparatus of concept to make, to make the music strong and valid in, in an intellectual way. But it was not designed to be like a, a law so much. So there have always been freedom, uh, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's the best thing we could hope from that. Back to the, um, to the sound as an audible, and um, let's have... Uh, one uh, example before the last one. It's a piece, uh, it's a short excerpt of a piece by Jean-Claude Risset called Mutation from 1977. And here Jean-Claude Risset used a psychophysiological effect uh, which has been developed as Shepard tone and Risset uh, modified it to uh, like a continuous, continuous tone. It's a sound that seems to go up forever and it's uh, basically tricking your ears with a technique of 
frequency coming, 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 and, and uh, um, I won't explain the reset tone right now, but basically the, the musical uh, dramaturgy here is made possible because your ear uh, works as it works. And uh, Jean-Claude could take advantage of that because he does that. And it's something that is so, uh, very much overlooked in uh, electroacoustic composition, but it's very important to have this notion of how the, the ear can, uh, can, um, can react. The, the fact that uh, the ear is not uh, uh, responding the same way between the frequency and the intensity of these curves you, le you learn uh, in school. But it's very important because it gives you um, another tool and it gives possibilities. And it can be very conceptual, but it can be also very, uh, very, very physical. Uh, so that's a, more like a physiological approach. Now, and to conclude, um, I'm going to something that's much more about cognition. Sorry, you, you get the idea. It's like this for like an hour. So, so it's a piece by um, American composer called Jeff German, uh, and it's called Croatoan from 1997. And here, it's not the psychophysiology of the ear that it's convoked, uh, but the cultural uh, meaning of the recording. It's a field recording. You 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 hear it it's like this for a long time. It doesn't change a lot. And it's a field recording recorded uh, uh, in the Kaukia Mounds State Historic Site, which is a pre-Columbian Native American city. And this city has been abandoned for mysterious reasons. And using the word Croatoan as the title of uh, the piece, uh, Jeff German refers to the lost colony of uh, Ronoake, um, the lost colony which has, was one of the first to attempt to settle a permanent colony in, in the um, America. Everybody disappeared without leaving any trace, and there were only one trace. Uh, the word Croatoan was carved into a tree. Um, and the Croatoan were a small tribe of American native. So this piece is very much about um, disappearance and the uh, erasement of uh, all the cultural background. It doesn't make s most, much sense if you just listen to it without any of this indication. But with this indication and with this background, you listen to it differently. So, um, that is to say that from uh, a pure sound event, a pure formalist approach, to a more conceptual, uh, even literary approach, you've got all these uh, possibilities for composition, and all are valid, of course. And um, I think what is uh, rather fascinating now in the uh, uh, acousmatic music production is that it's blend all these aspects. It's much more, it's much richer than uh, a pure formalist approach, for example. And I think it's a big playground, uh, and a lot has been done, but a lot has to be done as well. So, thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, we have maybe five minutes. <laughs>